there. Welcome to the Bronx Buzz. I am excited about tonight's show. I'm excited about every show, but uh, tonight in particular because my longtime friend, Bronx friend, uh, Howie Carpin, uh, is going to talk baseball with us, and uh, that's uh, exciting for me. And then in our second segment, we've got a great Bronx artist who has a show going on uh, at the uh, Riverdale um, Ethical Culture Society. Uh, but right now, let's talk baseball with Howie Carpin, one of the joys of my life. Nice to see you, Howie. How are you today? Oh, doing great. You know, I love this time of year and uh, getting to talk to you right here on the Bronx Buzz. Always uh, awesome. You know, um, we wait so long for that baseball season. <laughs> it's like it, it just doesn't start soon enough. Um, but let's talk about the rules to start. Um, I mentioned to you just before the show, uh, Jeff Passan um, put out, uh, a sports writer Jeff Passan uh, said that there were uh, 50 games in 2023 so far, and uh, they are a half hour shorter. Uh, the um, batting averages are 15 points higher. Uh, there are were 70 stolen bases compared to 29 the year before, and there were 40 pitch clock violations, which is just less than one a game. How do you evaluate the way the new rules are playing out right now? Uh, it's been fantastic. I mean, you think it's you know, been fantastic? I think so. I, I uh, you know, it's funny. I, you love to look, I still love to look at the box scores in the newspaper. I mean, that, look, I'm, I'm 68 years old, following the game since 1960, 61. And the first thing I looked for this year was time of the game. And so many are under three or 240, two, two and a half. I mean, it's, it's, it's play. It's great. You know, the game does move now. I, I, I love the banning of the shift to me, you know, when a guy hits a line drive over the infield that's going to fall in in front of the outfield, do you deserve a hit? Right. It was ridiculous after a while. You know, they, they came in with all these theories and these formulas, but it was making the game dull and boring. The game can be slow in itself. That's the nature of the game. Did but you to get into the slowness because of the drama that builds? Now there's a little there's pace to the game. There's more offensive weapons, more athleticism being demonstrated, especially in the field. You have to have range now in, in the infield again. They basically the shift covered for those kind of players. Now you need athletic players in the field. So it's I think it's been an overwhelming success. I, I'm not a big fan of the pitch clock. My feeling of it is, okay, I understand people want to shorten the game and everything else. Why not start with 20 seconds or 25 and then a year later make it 15 so that what we saw in, in uh, one of the um, Mets games over the weekend, uh, the Marlins pitcher was kind of running out of gas because late in the game, he, uh, you know, he was getting a little too winded and he needed a moment to breathe. That's, that's my feeling. I would rather have seen it um, gradually implemented uh, i'm not against uh you know having shorter games very fair comment but uh i thought it would be a little chaotic in the beginning you know you, you had a missed interpretation of the rule over the weekend in the met game yes you know, by, and they admitted that. it was a mistake so these things are going to happen but they'll adjust what what you fail to realize with the pitch clock it's not so much for the pitcher the batter now stays in the box he doesn't take Yes. You know, a, a guided you know, tour home plate area every pitch. He's staying yeah. in, you know, it's, yeah, it, it's a little quick for some of these guys who are not used to it. Even fans are kind of complaining that it's too I, fast. I, I'm one of those. I, 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 I like to, to sit adapt. and relax. It, yeah. It's a much better product on the field right now. <laughs> um, you can and, sit and relax during the game. No question. Uh, and and um, uh, what are players saying about it? Now, you uh, around the locker room sometimes. You, are they griping or they're just saying, look, it's the rule and we just got to do it? No. There's very few gripers, so to speak. Maybe Max Scherzer, and I don't know why, he, you know, he he's, has his stance, but it, uh, overwhelmingly the players approve. It, you know, it's going to make you sharper as a player because you're going to have to adapt to these to the quickness I think that you'll see the product improve even as the season goes on. Right now, it'd be a little chaotic. You knew that was going to happen. People have to adjust. I, I and listen. I don't want to spend more time on it because we have a lot to do, and you have a new book that we want to talk about as well. But um, I thought for the the shift rule, if players would just learn to hit, if Rod Carew came back, if they'd all hit a little bit like Jeff McNeil, then uh, you wouldn't need the shift rule. But I guess the way the game is now, it's not happening. 
Well, there was a philosophical difference with hitting to the opposite field, wasting your your power hitter, right. you know, trying to hit right. to the opposite field for a single. You know, it's interesting. Now you can still I'll say this quickly. You can still shift. You can move that left fielder into short right field. But that's true for a penalty now, because if the ball goes over the infield, there's no outfield there to keep it to yeah, a right. single. That's going to be a trick. Um, so, uh, Howie, I thought it was poetry in motion when Judge hit a home run on his first at bat. I thought that was just as great a moment as you could see at Yankee Stadium. Uh, they're two and one as we start. We're recording this on Monday. Of course, there'll be games before the show airs. Um, what, what's your evaluation? Are they set up pretty well? They've had pitching injuries. Um, what's your evaluation of the Yankees right now? I think they'll be okay. I think, you know, you can't expect them to jump out 61 and 23 like they did last year. And that proved to be a fluke because That's they were right. 38 that is and 40. True. They were a 500 team when they entered the playoffs. That's they weren't right. that great. And Houston, you know, took advantage and, and put them in the dust because they were much better. So I think they'll be all right. I think they'll win the division. I think, or they'll be right there. They'll be in the playoffs. You know, Judge is turning into a, just a remarkable player. I mean, if he stays healthy, who knows? The sky, knows the sky is the limit. Right. Um, you know, I, I was negligent at the beginning. I just assumed because we've been doing this for so long together. Uh, Howie Carpen is one of the official scorers of Major League Baseball, and he is an update anchor on Sirius. But as you can see, he's the guy I turn to for info on what's going on in the game. Um, so just um, what do the Yankees need at this point? Or at this point, play it out, and by the middle of the season, we'll know? Well, they're not going to get much offense from the catcher position. So, they, it, you know, it's going to be up to the rest of the lineup. I think a healthy DJ LeMay will be a big difference. I'm glad they're starting this kid as Waldo Cabrera in left field over Hicks. He, he gives them more energy, more athleticism. He's a switch hitter. You hope he can pick up the left side. You want to get Bader back in center field. Uh, Bader, who likes to go to the Riverdale Deli here, Liebman's. You know, yes, he does. Kid, you know, you want he's he's a terrific defender and True, you know, terrific player, and he has great skills. Um, another energy guy they can use. They more they have more energy in their lineup, especially with Volpe. I was going to say, and they did the right thing, putting the kid at shortstop. Just let him play; he's going to be fine. That's right. the way I look at it. Listen, I'm wearing my Mets tie today. I don't know if you can <laughs> see that. Um, uh, and and what do you think about the Mets? Mets had a nice start. They beat a team that they're much better than. Um, they the Verlander thing was was shocking to say the least. How do you evaluate where they're at? They're better than Miami always, but Miami right. always stings them. So this is a very good three out of four to start the season. Mm -hmm. Look, the Edwin Diaz loss is big, but here's my saying: closers save games; they don't win games. You can find a closer. Maybe you're not going to find as dominant as he was last year. And if you know baseball. There's no guarantee he was going to come back and do it again. Three years ago, everyone wanted him off the Mets because he yeah, was so right. bad. Now, now, relievers, sometimes closers are a dime a dozen. The Giants, when they won their three championships in the 2010s, they had three different closers. That's right. Sometimes That's... You, you switch even in midstream. I... Just reverting back to the Yankees quickly, Clay Holmes is their closer. He won't be by the end of the year. I have a feeling Michael King will be their closer. So there's an example. You know, you, you can cover for that. Yeah. And, you, and you know, listen, you, we, we've both been around a long time. David Robertson's a, a top-notch major league pitcher. Uh, and um, and obviously Buck knows how to maneuver his um, his staff uh, beautifully. Listen, I wanted to – here's some of the books that Howie has written. Uh, and uh, I've got them here. Let's see. There was Yankees Essential. That was your first, you said? Yeah, that was 16 okay. years. Then this one you said is is going to be reissued uh, the down about Kindness Corner. It's been re-released at re a much cheaper price. Okay, and uh, th this one I love the Mets Perfect Season. That was, the fun. That was a lot of fun. That was, uh, you know, it's funny you showed that one because I did one of the last interviews with Seaver for that book. Wow. At least that you know from what I can recollect. That I thanked Ethan Wilson. Ethan Wilson of the Mets set me up for a phoner with him. Wow. And, uh, Boy, I mean, what, a, what a thrill. That, that I'm sure it was. So hold up. You got the book there? You got a new book? Yep. Let's see. What is it? And, and we can put it up. I know Anderson's got a picture of it. Uh, the New York Yankee first. Um, now, there was a Mets first. And the yeah, Mets so first was um, uh, players talking about their first. What is this right. book? This is a quiz book. A quiz uh, book. Sort of, sort of like the one I did 
uh, which was called So You Think You're a New York Yankees Fan. I did right. that about five years ago. And, it, you know, I, I, I didn't think it was going to be that great, but it happened. To, I got 195 reviews on Amazon over that wow. book, and it's still selling. So uh, this one's almost like a follow-up, except it's first in Yankee history. And the answer, you know, I go, I give you a little background and, and some interesting notes about the uh, the answer. So, you know, yeah, I had to stretch a little. Like, here's here's an example of a question. I was going to ask you to ask me a question and put me on the spot. I, not not that right. I'm going to get any of this, but go ahead. Uh, what year was the first Mickey Mantle Day? First Mickey Mantle Day. Yeah, there were two of them. <laughs> I w- I would think it would have had to have been at the end of his career. So, you know, like, I don't know, 1966 or something? Am I... 65. 65. So I had the right idea. So I, went in, I went into, in that, that part of the book, I talk about the two Mickey Mantle days. A lot of people don't remember the first one. He was still in uniform in that one. Yeah. And they had banners, like a Met Banner Day. They had people walking on, on the track. And he's, wow. he's looking at the banners. And he was in the dugout watching everything. Yeah. Well, wow. so that, and, that's, and then, that's one of the questions. When when was the second Mickey Mantle Day? Sixty nine, June eighth. June eighth, sixty and sixty nine. Now uh, he was a commentator uh, for the nineteen sixty nine World Series. I I recall. So he yeah, was no longer in uniform. Video. Was he still in uniform in sixty nine? No. No. He retired in March of '69. Uh, and um, for you writing the book, um, these these are th- it's a joy, right? You do your research and you put it together. Oh yeah, I love it. I mean, uh, and and uh, so I, this I, is your twelfth book, you had said, right? I'm, I'm wow. Seven baseball and five hockey. I've been on, you know, I'm an historian. I I, li- I like history. I love this, you know. I, it keeps me a. Uh, in touch with my childhood still looking back and you know the mem- you have all those memories I'm sure, sure. Um, i i just remember you telling me that you had a catch on the field with willie randolph that still is one of the highlights in my mind i said wow how he got to do that <laughs> um before we run we do got to run um greatest game you ever scored most amazing game you ever scored um uh, well i did i did my I did a no hitter last year against. I've done two no hitters. Probably the most memorable is Game Four, of the 0-1 World Series, when uh, Tino Martinez tied it up. I mean, oh, I remember the, that. The building was literally shaking. I was, really uh, was. I, I at on the, at that moment, I was working at that time. Let's just tell old stories. I was working for Channel Four, and I was sitting in the truck watching it on TV uh, outside the stadium. Anyway, Howie Carpen, uh, let's enjoy baseball. I wish I had a champagne. Let's pop the champagne. <laughs> and um, enjoy the game. Do the right job. We want to know hit or error or pass ball or wild pitch. We want you to get it right every time. It's Well, we'll try. You know, I've been fooling <laughs> them for 25. This is my 25th year. So And, and so them. let's uh, everybody look for Yankee, the New York Yankees first. That's, right, uh, Lions New- Press. Lions Press. All right. Listen, the great Howie Carpenter, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to take a short break. We're going to switch gears, and we're going to talk to a great Bronx artist. So uh, don't go away. Dear moms and dads, what you have achieved here today is going to help us and our futures. It is why we are coming up on stage to collect your diplomas. You know it's true. Mom, love you always. Everything I do. do When you graduate, they graduate. Visit finishyourdiploma.org to find free and supportive adult education centers near you. You're not going to get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. Mama! Like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. Feel the beat of nature at a park or forest near you. Find a forest and music inspired by nature at discovertheforest.org. Fostering a pet for a friend or neighbor can keep families together. Learn more at petsandpeopletogether.org. Okay, back with you on the Bronx Buzz. We thank Howie Carpin uh, for his great insight into uh, the world of baseball. We check in with him at the beginning of every baseball season. But right now, we're going to switch gears and talk to a Bronx artist. And uh, we'll say um, good evening to Eric Collin. Nice to see you, Eric. 
It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you uh, for joining us. Um, let's just talk about you as an artist. When did you say to yourself, you know, I like being an artist and, when, and, and wanted to do all this work? I think this is when I was a child and just, you know, was obsessed with comic books and cartoons. And I wanted to express that the best I can. So throughout high school, myself and friends of mine, you know, we would copy stuff from the comics and eventually, you know, s took those skills to start expressing ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going to um, SUNY Purchase for fine art for the, my first two years and school of visual arts to finish off my bachelor's degree. And uh, did you um, say to yourself, you know, I think I'm going to be an artist for all time or did you kind of like uh, realize well it's not an easy way to get rich so you did other work or have you really been a full-time artist uh since even way back then well so the story goes that recently i'm an artist out of the closet because <laughs> um you know I i've never heard that expression before well, I like I'll, that. I'll explain and this will make sense <laughs> okay um you know. <laughs> yes so, yeah, I graduated school of visual arts with friends We, you know, we, I took illustration and like everybody else, I wanted to conquer the world um, of illustration. And my first big job was from an organization called Nobody Beats the Wiz. So this was nice stepping out of college and having a poster that was up in New York. Oh, New wow. York City. That's yeah. very cool. It was throughout New York City um, and in the newspapers and it was great. And I'm thinking, okay, this is my career. This is great. But after that, it just either, and I don't know if it was my lack of maturity or business sense. Don't or, never admit to that. Never admit to that. Well, no, I mean, I have, look, <laughs> I have to look back and really realize what went wrong commercially. Right. So I, then I also was um, teaching, you know, I started teaching in the New York City Department of Education I wasn't and were you were you teaching artwork? Were you teaching art? No. Yeah, no. of course they laid off all the art teachers. No, it wasn't them. that. You know, oh, it, was, okay. it was too personal for me. Oh, um, I see. If a kid didn't want to do art, uh, you know, if they didn't want to that do was art, frustrating. You know, but if they didn't want to do social studies, which I ended up doing for nine years, and then I ended up being a, a computer person after that, uh, basically bringing technology into the Department of Education, one of nine people going throughout the city on something called Project Smart. You know, I didn't take that so personally. Right, right. So, um, but I had to make a decision early on because, you know, I spent all my free time trying to make it as an illustrator. And then I spent all my other time- so I'm, I'm trying to move it ahead to the yeah. punchline. And the punchline is then you eventually said, you know what, I'm an illustrator and this is my passion and this is my life. Well, I said, I'm, an, I'm a teacher for 31 years, and it's only last year that I came out of here. Ah, all right, listen, it. it's ne never too late. Yeah. Um, what we need to uh, mention is that you have an exhibit going on right now yes. at the uh, Riverdale Society of Ethical Culture. Um, uh, your, your work is, is different, let's put it this way, and I'm thrilled that um, the world is going to get to see it, and I'm thrilled that our audience on the Bronx Buzz is going to get to see it. So, Anderson, uh, play the magic box here. Let's take a look, and we're going to ask Eric to talk about some of his work. All right. <laughs> this is a nice way to start. What, what is this? Okay. This, this <laughs> help help was an, me uh, here. <laughs> this was an album cover I did for a bad heavy metal me band many years ago. It I mean, is I, I, um, Anderson, pop that up again. I want to um, look at that again. The kids seem to love it. I've had it on T-shirts that they've bought. It creeps me out to this day because <laughs> it's really, uh, you know, about child endangerment and, and being false uh, with a kid. So, uh, but yeah, that's where it's at. You know, it's and, and both the cartoony stuff. And the serious stuff. How, how long does it take? Like, you do, you, do you do one every day? Does a thing like that take days and days and then you go back to it? Uh, I mean, how long is it? Well, back in the days, I had more free time to just see a piece <laughs> through. I can do it for a week. Now, if I work on a piece once a week, I'm happy. So it may take a month or two to, to finish a piece. All right. Let's, uh, let's look at another. Okay. <laughs> as, as if people didn't get it up you know this is just lovely i mean i you know thank you this is actually you. i just did a black and white of this recently that's going to be in a coloring book uh 
for an organization in Rockland County. It was part of a series I did for of Mexican dancers and instrumentalists. So I did uh, about four or five pieces, and uh, this was my favorite, actually. Um, uh, <clears throat> do you, you know, I hate to ask this question because it seems so so uh, all good simple, questions. but but um, you know, where do you get the inspiration from? Do you walk down the block and say, "Oh, I ought to make a cartoon of the deli," or do you say, um, you know, "I think I'll now do a series of musicians"? In other words, where where do you get the the concepts and the ideas? I think something sticks in your craw that you want to get out, and eventually you know, you do sketches and some things work. And when it works, it works. And that becomes the start. For example, I'm doing cat paintings now. That is where I'm at. Um, <laughs> there's no- I, I have great sympathy for you there. <laughs> well, one walks by, you'll, you'll get my- <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, all right, let's 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 uh, take a look at another, go ahead. <laughs> and you also, and, and let's just mention, you also have quite an imagination. Presumably you didn't see this in the deli. <laughs> no, but I saw it in my head, and what inspired that is I had a friend who worked at the Renaissance Fair, and that was back in the day I was Ooh. able to actually uh, camp out overnight there, and I got inspired, and this is before Game of Thrones and all that dragon stuff, um, so I did like a year or two of dragons uh, based on just that inspiration, and that one I call Dragon on the Beach. Um, do you, do you um, uh, as far as materials... Um, uh, you know, uh, water paints, uh, pencils, markers, or do you just kind of make it up depending on what you're working um, on? So I start out with a sketch, which could be just be a sketchy line drawing. With, with, uh, I, with a pencil kind of thing? Yeah, just I'm a just pen curious. at a okay. diner. And I ended up bringing the <laughs> diner paper oh, so, and taking so, it home with me. So when you go to the diner, you ask for the kids' menu and they have the little coloring area. Okay, that's basically good. that's kind of weird. <laughs> I've ripped up plenty of menus from Italian restaurants, <laughs> taking them home with me. Uh, plenty of placemats, I mean. So uh, I take the sketch and then I develop it bigger in black and white. And you can kind of see a black and white here. Um, yeah. That I'm starting now, and then it becomes an acrylic painting. I only work in acrylic. Uh, despite the fact that a lot of my work may look like watercolor. I wonder what your dreams and nightmares are like, but that's... <sighs> well, <we're not> going <laughs> there. Especially after staring at like at, at, at like that dragon for a long time, because it takes a little while to do it. Well, I'll say this, that I'm, uh, I would feel that I'm a better person because I do get it out on the canvas. Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. There you go. Self-expression. All right, what's next? <laughs> Let's see another. I'm not shy. I'm ready to see more. <laughs> Speak, speaking of nightmares. Well, I don't see this as nightmare. I see it as artistic fury. When it All right, to, fair. You know, I'm not a musician, but I get it. And uh, but, but, know, uh, Anderson, put that one up again. I want to see that one again. You know, he's he's involved in his world of music. And, and, it, and it takes all of him from, uh, you know, the body in the background. Um, every, every day you, you, you put something on something down every day to keep yourself I, going? I wish I had that time. Uh, um. I have a 12 year old son. Uh, you know, it, it gets distracting around the house. So I can't do it every day, but uh, I am in the middle. Of, like, in, in, all right. Now, now we're going to really do the torture part. Uh, in your mind, would you like to do it every day? I would like to spend more time with it. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, oh. definitely clearing some space so that next year uh, I can do that. You know, you know, I, I have to tell you, I mean, this is what I do for a living. I could do this 24 hours a day, sit here and talk to people on TV. And, and I believe me, I know the frustrations that, oh, rats, I got to do something else with my life. Uh, <laughs> well, no, I'm doing plenty of things. That's the problem. No, yeah. I know. I, believe me, I get it. I'm involved in all sorts of stuff that this is one of the things that I, that I get to do. This becomes the relief or the release. All right. So let's, uh, how many more do we got? We got one or two more. Let's see what we got. See, this oh, yeah. I like. I like this a lot. This was done very recently, and I think it was inspired by the Me Too movement in some ways. I call it the Queen's Escape. Uh, I think its message is obvious about the uh, Jack and the King kind of trying to exploit the Queen and the Queen actually releasing herself from the card and uh, finding a way out. All right, put it put it up one more time, Anderson. Let's just get another look. There it is. <laughs> the Queen emerges from the card. 
Um, have you uh, thought about um, actually doing like a full comic book and writing a story and, and uh, doing that? Not comics because I like to do single illustrations now, but if someone had a project that was a children's book type thing, an illustrated book, that I'd consider. Right. Uh, and, and art is different. I think that. I'm what, not... Say that again. What art? sequential where it's uh the story is i see because you'd have to make the same character each time and of course maybe in a different way or something like that right and your thing is that's the image that's the image that's the image. i want the image to tell the story on multiple levels is this um exhibit at the riverdale um society for ethical culture like the first time that you've seen all your work uh, displayed somewhere? I mean, in 30 years, I think, uh, you know, 35 years ago, I may have had a small exhibit somewhere. But yes, this is kind of the awakening. This is my first solo exhibit. And uh, the pieces are still up there on the wall for people to view. uh, Uh, Well, you know, what's interesting to me, and I didn't realize this, but over, what is that? I lose my sense of direction. Your right or left shoulder is that card picture are the yes. ones that you create that large i mean it looks like eight um, and a half by 11 or no, even it's actually it's it's a little larger these are prints and really really nice prints i see the work uh, sometimes i have to label on the back because i can't tell the difference but this is almost the size of the original the original is 18 by 24 um and so what i was getting at when i was asking about um you know was that your first uh, exhibit what's it like to walk in a room and see you surrounded by in a way and I, I've talked to numerous artists, all of your children. I mean, these, 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 are the, these are your kids. This is who you've given birth to, so to speak. Well, What's it like to walk in there and see all that? They've been with me for a while. So for me, it's not me seeing them, but what it's like for others to see them and what reaction am I getting? Because remember, not having shown, I didn't know a year ago whether my work would be accepted whether ah. it was good compared to others well, I'm still finding its audience listen it, it's it's just fantastic work you are a brilliant artist and we are thrilled to have hosted you on uh, the Bronx buzz um so it's the Riverdale Society of Ethical Culture which is on Fieldston Road up there in the Northwest Bronx and um, there is there was an opening reception and uh, why don't you share where people can watch that opening reception um well they can watch it on my web uh, on my website. Eric Collin, yeah, ericcollinart.com. There should be a link to it there. And I will post it on my social media, my Instagram, a link. Uh, it'll be, uh, you know, fo- please follow me at Eric Collin Art. Right. And I'll, Eric, I'll, I'll, yeah, Eric E-R-I-C-K-O-L-L-I-N art.com. Uh, Eric, listen, thank you so much for joining us on the Bronx Buzz. Congratulations on your work. We want to see more and more of it. Uh, artwork in the Bronx is, you know, core stuff. So we appreciate you and uh, your time this evening. And I appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. Great. No problem. All right. So that will do it for the Bronx Buzz. And um, we want to thank Howie Carpin and his insights in baseball. Boy, he is he is a very important figure in Bronx baseball. And uh, for Eric, who's an important figure in Bronx art. And uh, that's going to be our show for the Bronx Buzz tonight. And you know what happens? Yeah, we'll see you next week. Goodbye.